David, to you, I suppose to your presentation, but um, others please join in. Um, we talked about infrastructure densities, height, and in my experience, there's a bit chicken and egg. And if you take our experience with Canary Wharf, the Jubilee Line, two, uh, two years later than needed, uh, didn't help uh, Olympia and York, the developer. So in your experience around the world, is anybody getting it right? Um, I think around the world, it's, it's, there, are, there, are much, there are good examples, particularly in China, because the, but then there's a very clear way where the infrastructure is being put in place in, in, in a very rapid succession. But then in most cases, they're dealing with cities that... Uh, you know, dwarf London. They're 20, 20 million uh, people uh, cities. But it is the key to the whole thing of how do you actually get that infrastructure in and actually get adequate infrastructure because, um, again, it comes back down to what are you going to design and how you set that. Canary Wharf was very clear when it started. Mm. It had its remit, which now looks gratuitously large in terms of energy use and everything else. Um, but I think the modern cities, I mean, you know, those emerging markets, it's going to be very important for Brazil, India... China, I think, you know, there, there's a, a totally different view of how we're going to tackle that. Uh, a question um, for Nigel Biggs, really, about uh, values. Um, we looked at how uh, it's difficult it is for developers to time it right with a cycle. But again, from, your, from experience around the world, ultimately, does every tall building make money once the cycle catches up, or have there been some white elephants? Well, I think there are quite a few um, short-term white elephants, but I think tall buildings, because of their nature of being unique and fairly spectacular in the landscape, eventually do find their mark. Um, so I think in the long run they get there, um, but it can take some time. Yeah, it's David Scott uh, from Langer Rock. I've got a question for David Glover. Um, you showed uh, in your slide adding steelwork to resist vibration uh, and accelerations. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, wouldn't a more sustainable approach be to try and educate people that buildings move, that yeah. floors move as well? And I know that, that in the States, uh, where I've been for the last 15 years, we have a more relaxed approach to building vibrations than you do here. And it seems to me that, that uh, groups are adding a lot of uh, pressure to actually make the vibrations imperceptible to, to occupants, which seems to me to be a, a waste of money. If you're 400 metres up in the air, then maybe you should expect to, to move a little. I'm, I totally agree, David. I think the thing is, is that the diagram there is to show that there are better ways of put them putting steel in there. Um, creating those criteria, I, I agree with you, we've, we've created them ourselves and they vary across the world, but uh, I think if I go back to the example I showed, the Hancock Tower actually moves, I think it's something like nine foot at the top, but nobody believes they're moving nine foot, and it's all you have is a little wheel in your coffee, but nobody feels sick, they're used to it, they get accustomed to it, it's a bit like sailing on a boat. Um, but that's the nature we live in. People get more secure, they find ways to do that, and I think there's certain areas where we have pushed it too far. There's no doubt about that. Moving on to a question on, on costs to Steve. Steve, I was, I was interested to see your uh, um, uh, slides at the end about new ideas on uh, prefabrication. I suppose in, in my experience, one always assumes that prefabrication saves time, but you pay a premium. Is that so, and will it always be so? That, that, that tends to have been the, uh, the conclusion that most teams come to historically, um, but I, I don't think that will always be so. Um, I think um, you know, techniques that are used to, in, in sort of prefabrication are, are improving. But even if you, you were in a, a situation where there's a premium, there's also a benefit. And um, you know, that benefit is time, and time is so important, not only from a, a cost perspective, um, and, you know, I've seen some eye-watering figures in terms of finance charges on some, on some of these buildings. Um, but also in terms of controlling costs and controlling quality um, and, and reducing a risk. So uh, there are probably many occasions where actually if there is a premium, it's a premium worth paying. Uh, hi, Bridget Witt from Quadrangle Architects in Toronto. Uh, one of the Nigel, sorry, I'm not sure which one of you is which, uh, from CBRE, you were talking about uh, office uh, occupancy amounts per occupant in a floor plate of uh, one per eight square meters, is that right? Yes. yes that's right. Um, are you finding that that amount of occupancy, which if I calculate correctly is about 
85 square feet per person, because I'm uh, kind of moving between metric and imperial. Uh, are you finding that that is very sector specific, the kind of people that will accept that limited amount of space, or are you finding it, it's becoming more generally acceptable? Our office is 135 square feet per person, and that's already very tight, it seems to me. Right. Um, look, at, yes, it's a good point. Um, I think some industries will move towards a lower rate um, faster than other industries. I remember quite a few years ago, all the new workspace planning was in the IT industry. Um, what we're finding in Asia, I actually did a, a survey about six months ago. We find, found that densities, square meters, were going down to as low as uh, 6, 6.9, 7, 7.5 across all industries, including the professional firms and not so much the financial companies. I think they have tended to be more spread out. So yes, it is a trend. I think it is across most sectors, but of course some will always look for you know, uh, more space per employee. Yeah. Brief as I possibly can, Steve. Yep. Um, Thank you. Greg Dunn from Adamson. It's just a quick question for the Nigels, uh, but I think it sort of tunes into what, what's already being um, put on for debate today. Steve's um, ideal efficient building, um, some of what uh, goes over and above that is a premium that's, that's done to create what I think we heard today was maybe the term brand. Um, so the question goes to the Nigels really is, is how much is that brand worth? Um, and is that brand something that's, can you ever just produce it on the day the building opens or is it something that has to develop as uh, as time passes and the building gets adopted by the city? I think that's, it, it is really crucial, the brand. Um, and I think it, it's definitely something that's not from day one. I mean, built, tenants occupy these buildings as a statement of their own image. They are iconic, they're the most expensive, they are a statement about themselves, and they want their, their clients to enjoy the experience of arriving, to, to enjoy the building they're in. And if they don't, the architecture is what it is, and that doesn't change over time. But you can very easily change the experience you have as you travel through the building through bad staffing and through rudeness and through uh, dirtiness, etc. So they are the basics, but when you go into a five-star hotel, you, they're not all the same. The ones that are most successful just have that edge. And I think that's the brand is part of that. And it's interesting that in the US that we brand buildings protect with their name, whether it's the Willis Building, the Chrysler. In the UK, we tend to now brand um, buildings by their shape. Um, we were pitching for the Gherkin last year, and uh, the, the owners asked us a very specific question. You, as CBRE, are you going to call it the Gherkin or St. Mary's the Axe? And we didn't know which way the owners were going to go, so it was 50-50. And we chose the Gherkin, which was luckily aligned to the owner's viewpoint, and we won the instruction, which is great. But, it's, but for us, the brand is now part of that image. Um, and you know, the Gherkin has a global brand. I mean, we're in Shanghai last year, and the brand was everywhere in, in, in images, in photographs. Um, so I think, coming back to your question, is it day one? Absolutely, you have to keep it evergreen and you have to reinforce the brand standards constantly and the service you get in the building. So I thought some, some uh, common themes there amongst the, the, the speeches there that uh, link quite nicely and uh, I thought those were four great presentations. So can we just thank the guys in the usual way? Thank you.